Why? Hello and welcome everybody. Also, good morning. So today I wanted to go ahead and talk to you guys about kind of like some super hyper endgame optimization for the Righteous Fire build. I've been putting out a lot of more beginner friendly content, but I want to also help out the people who uh, have kind of amassed a large amount of currency. So with that being said, uh, I want to go ahead and talk about a quick interaction that we found out about. So a little while ago, I don't remember when Paranda's Pact came out, but Basically, Paranda's Pact is a jewel that has a random modifiers that it rolls. And back in the day, I would say like two, maybe three leagues ago, oftentimes I would actually come over to this region here, either from the top side or this side here. And I would put in a unnatural instinct here, primarily for my Explode Righteous Fire builds, because the 30% AOE you get, 36% here, is very strong. Now, unnatural instinct, what it does, <clears throat> effectively is when you put it in here anything that is highlighting that is not allocated gets allocated to you so when i slap this in you can see a bunch of uh basically aoe life regen base life you, you can kind of see but in recent times i kind of moved away from this because with our chieftain build we kind of have built in explode and the aoe just didn't really feel necessary however this jewel over here called paranda's pact when you allocate it over here will give us 6% fire damage on anything that we have allocated. The nice thing about the allocation is because of the way Unnatural Instinct works, it's even giving us damage on nodes we don't have allocated because Unnatural Instinct allocates those, if that makes sense. So here's just a quick example of uh, my current character. So my Righteous Fire is dealing 970k. And my fire trap over here is up to just about 3.2 million. Um, now, do note that this is in the tanky variant of my build. This is not in the POB. This is far past like the league starter. So I will explain kind of what I have done to opt out to be more tanky. So first off, if you're not doing the unnatural instinct and Paranda's pact, as I do believe this may be gated behind a mage blood because I am coming over here and I am dropping hardy and barbarism. This is a ton of life regen, but the Mage Blood Ruby Flask can kind of fix this. If you look at my sustain, it gives me like 800, right? So <clears throat> the Mage Blood Ruby Flask also happens to give nine max res, which is a very strong combination. It's also why you see me using a Dawnbreaker. But anyway, if you are not doing the uh, Unnatural Instinct and Paranda's Pact, what I recommend you do is drop this whole top side here, and you're just going to swing back and connect across here. That way, you still have access to coming upwards into the life wheel. And the reason for this is because we are using the life mastery for 10% more life if you have at least six life masteries. Now, if I remove this, you'll notice my life goes down a bunch. And the reason for this is because we have a decent amount of base life. We have a ton of percentage increase from adorned. But stacking percentage increase is going to have diminishing returns because there's only so many sources of flat life we can get. So to remedy this, we go for the life mastery setup, which basically shoots our life up. Now this has very good synergy with stuff, for example, like Defiance of Destiny. For players who are looking for more damage, I would not really do that. And again, this is like a much higher level setup. I probably wouldn't look into doing this until I go Adorned. Um, and speaking of Adorned, for players who are struggling to try to go Adorned, Remember that you do not have to go with Fire Multi. These are obviously the ones I recommend. But as you know, this is a player driven economy and people will try to basically snipe what I purchase. A much cheaper variant is looking for Fractured Burning Damage. Um, so that way you can at least have some jewels in. And then when you start switching them to Multiplier Jewels, you will get a big buff. Well, not like a crazy big buff. They're, they're also pretty good. Other than that, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of show my gear a little bit. This is the dagger we crafted. You can find it on the website. Still using the same helm. I might I might look at some of the like unethical crafting people are doing with graveyard crafting. I'm just kind of lazy and haven't really done the graveyard crafting. We're actually sitting on um how many how many tabs do we have here? 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 uh, let's see here 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 we'll get there soon <clears throat> okay so anyway i'm gonna go ahead and jump into a map real fast and kind of show you how this setup works what should i have on roll yeah all right i would go around a t17 but i'm half asleep right now and don't want to somehow die if that's even possible right now i actually haven't looked at t17 since they changed them so i am curious to go see 
Uh, yeah, that looks good. Mine Harvey and chill. Good. So this is basically a refined version of the Harbinger Atlas that I was running prior. Um, this one runs one of each Harvey Scarab. And on top of... Ooh, this is not the right filter. There we go. So this one focuses more on finding scarabs and also runs one of each harbinger scarab. I do believe that the version I was running before, which is like the three rusteds and stuff, is probably potentially better income in the earlier stages. But I think when you're going longevity, you want to go with uh, one of each because you're kind of really preying on the fracture drops. Uh, by fracture drops, I'm replying, or, uh, talking about the fracturing orbs. Now, for people who are wondering where these colorful explodes are coming from, uh, this is also because of what I have decided to do um, kind of at the super late game. So basically, I have dropped Divine Judgment and I have Anointed Charisma along with an Enlightened 3, which you can find here. And this allowed me to get in uh, fit in Herald of Ash. Now, the only downside is I'm also using a Reservation Jewel because I vault one here. And if you're not using one of these, you can still run it, but you won't have enough MP for, like, Frost Blink or anything. So, that would be the only problem with that. Uh, to remedy that, you could go with an Enlightened 4, but I'm sure that is very expensive. The Herald of Ash, I would not say, is, like, efficient for damage scaling. It's just since I like to play my RF builds as a mapper, fitting in a Herald of Ash just kind of adds another level of enjoyment, I guess you could say, when you just see the volcanic explosions everywhere. <laughs> I don't know, it's very, uh, it's very nice. This character now in the end game setup is actually rocking 100% physical damage taken as elemental, uh, relying on the taste of hate. A large source of where I acquired the max res is after I put on a mage blood, I decided to pivot into a tankier setup. Now, the reason why I talk about the mage blood uh, is we found two of them during the rogue exile strategy, but more so because I don't really like making POBs built around mage bloods because that's a lot of work to keep updated. I would rather, you know, if I play it, I share my findings with you guys, but I like to keep the POBs where I spend a lot of my time on focused on more. Entry level, mid budget, SSF, higher budget, but not like ridiculous budget. But with that being said, the Mage Blood allowed me to drop a Rise of the Phoenix in favor of a Dawnbreaker. This Dawnbreaker uh, is probably pretty expensive. I bought it for 10 Divines. It has 27% physical damage taken as Lightning. Now remember, once you are Shock Immune or very highly resistant to Shock, which you can acquire via reduced effective shock on your flask and by using tattoos i don't have them currently on your int over here you can use reduced effective shock here this can help you achieve close to if not 100 percent reduced effective shock at that point it doesn't really matter if you're converting your physical damage to fire lightning or cold the only downside is if you are not immune to shock or very resistant you may occasionally get shocked which is kind of bad and if you do not have annihilations approach boots um, then you will actually get chilled, which doesn't actually affect your damage. It's just nobody really wants to get chilled, right? So anyway, moving on to this, the Dawnbreaker has 27% physical mitigation. Now, my character doesn't have as much regeneration as I would like. I probably only have like maybe 800 to 1k. Like right now it says 2k, but that's not my actual regen, right? Because RF is pulling from that with Annihilation's approach. But with Defiance of Destiny, you don't actually need a lot of recovery anymore because the monsters essentially just heal you, right? Defiance of Destiny makes it so whenever your health is getting low, you heal X percentage of the missing unreserved life before you're hit. That means that the calculation happens before the damage, which means that if they can't do X amount of damage, they literally can't kill me, right? This is why Defiance of Destiny is such a crazy item. Of course, it is also a very expensive item, but do remember that I cleared my first T17 very early on into the league, about three days in, my character was very weak. I mean, it was like a 15 minute boss fight that I was kiting level to 100 without it. So these are more super, super chase items. I would not say they are mandatory for any stage in progression. In fact, I was even farming this Harbinger stride here before I had any of this gear. I believe you can, can see that on YouTube as well.
Okay. So that is pretty much the character. Um, to talk about the lightning coil, because a lot of people, I'm going to kind of just like FAQ answer some, some high-end questions here that people ask. The reason I'm using a lightning coil over a cloak of flame is because cloak of flame has 40% physical damage from hits converted to fire. Uh, lightning coil has 50. So 10, you know, 50 beats 40. But Cloak of Flame has a couple of distinct advantages. Number one, it actually gives you fire resist, which means it's also giving you cold and lightning because of the ascendancy on Chieftain over here, um, Salo cleansing water. Furthermore, the ignite duration on it, even if you have a minimum roll ignite duration, when your character is in like very poopy gear, that ignite duration is a massive damage multiplier to your Chieftain explode um, Hinakora. When you later on have like a lot more gear and your build feels very strong, you don't really have to worry about that. But for me, I did not do the swap to Lightning Coil until the Mage Blood. And again, the primary reason of the Mage Blood um, for this setup is because the Ruby Flask gives me so much fire res that it allows me to stay overcapped even while wearing a Lightning Coil. You can try making the swap without it. I don't think it's going to feel as good. You're also going to lose net regen because remember, Fire res also is one flat life regeneration, which then gets scaled by your increases. So that's a very big thing as well. Other than that, um, some other questions that a lot of people ask is when do they move RF to the helmet and when do they put fire trap in the body armor? For me, there are two distinct scenarios when this occurs. Number one, when you have an awakened burning damage level five, the reasoning for that is when it hits level five, you get plus one to your fire skills. You want to give that to your fire trap. You don't care if that's on your righteous fire because plus one doesn't matter for it. So this plus one gives your fire trap so much damage and the higher it goes, the stronger it is. So for example, this puts it to 29 uh, right over here. Another option on when you switch your fire trap to the body armor is when you have a corrupted body armor designed for fire trap. The reason I bring emphasis to design for fire trap is because you cannot really scale RF anymore with plus level of gems. So because you can't scale it with plus level of gems, it loses one of the most impactful corruptions for scaling your damage. So I highly recommend A, when you get a corruption design for fire trap, which could be like AOE gems, trap and mine gems, duration gems, etc. Or you go with the level five awaken gem and then you do this. Now do note that when you make this swap, what I personally like to do is I like to pivot into an Essence of Horror helmet, which is a lot more expensive. Now this is crafted by using the Essence of Horror, you can see because of the more elemental, until you hit a burning damage roll. Now you have to be careful because if you're running Righteous Fire with Conk Effect, your AoE is massively going to go down. Some people are okay with this, but this is one thing to note. The only time I like to use Righteous Fire in a Conk Effect helmet is if it's the third modifier. So you always hear me say two of three when we're referring to helmets. I'm referring to socketed gems deal 30% more elemental. Socketed gems are supported by level 16, 18, or 20 burning damage, and then conk effect on top of that, which would be basically be in place of the adds 22 damage to fire or whatever. That's where the conk effect would want to be. Anyway, I hope that this video helped you guys out. If it did, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. I'll try to get into making some more beginner-friendly stuff for people who are stuck a little bit. Um, mainly one about purity of fire breakpoints and talking about how to maintain your 90 elemental res. Um, that'll probably be the next video, but go ahead and let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Anyway, I am done for now. I'm going to go get the live stream ready, so hope you guys had a wonderful time. Hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. Remember, if you did, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And you can catch me streaming live every day at twitch.tv slash fox, except for Sundays. See you guys all tomorrow.